Um, and I'm going to be talking about signal preservation, um, thinking about sort of from the large scale, um, a global perspective on magnetite dissolution, but also digging into thinking about Greigite formation as well. Um, and before I really kick it off, I wanted to acknowledge that, you know, this work is actually um, Jack Chrysler. It was his senior thesis. And um, Josie Benson is a current master's student working with me. Um, and Will Levitt and then Roger joined on board to help that crew. So this is a lot of data that was created by my students um, and not by me. So I'm really excited to share it though with you. Okay. So why do we care, right? So why do we care about preserving signal? And I think that this is something that, you know, everyone in this room have, as we've started to have these conversations has been diving into is when we think about applications to try to understand ancient earth history, they maybe fall into two broad categories. You could argue, you could say there's more, but, you know, we think of paleomagnetism, which, you know, could involve paleogeography, um, magnetostratigraphy, or using it as geochronology. And then more recently we've been doing paleo intensity. But there's also this field of environmental magnetism. And environmental magnetism um, has been focused sort of in recent time. Um, however, there's been a lot of work um, driven by myself. I know Ken Kodama has been involved. Other folks have been involved of pushing this to the deep time record of trying to understand um, ancient environments using the magnetic, um, magnetic tools that we've developed to understand modern environments or recent environments. And so, all of these, as soon as we, you know, start to think about sediments in the sedimentary rock record or the sediment record, we have this terrifying word diagenesis that needs to come to mind. Because when our sediment is deposited, this is what it looks like, right? You know, it's lovely, these tiny little grains. Um, but after a sediment is deposited, there's this wide array of processes that can occur within sediments before they become rocks. This includes there's microbially mediated mineralization in pore waters, there's dewatering, compaction, cementation, and all of these are included in this word diagenesis. And this happens during and after lithification. So this means that all ancient sediments and sedimentary rocks by definition have had diagenesis affecting them. So this is something that anyone studying earth history using the sedimentary rock record or sediments has to think about. Um, and I have a quote from my sedimentology professor who thought differently than I did about diagenesis. I think it's an amazing, fascinating process that we need to understand. So that's what I'll be talking about now. So here's sort of a diagram about um, pore water chemistry. And um, this is what we, it's a huge generalization, idealized, um, but this, um, Andrew Roberts had a really great um, review paper called Mineral, um, magnetic mineral diagenesis, one of those, um, and um, this is from there. And so we think that there's these changes and these chemical zonations as um, sediments are deposited that happen in um, pore waters that we see, you know, oxygen becomes slowly depleted and we see increases in some of these other phases. Um, and this um, is actually related to their energy yield, right? Um, and that's because at the same time, we actually, the reason for these changes in chemistry as we go down, you know, sort of a, um, a sedimentary profile at the bottom of the ocean or um, a, a water body system, even lakes, is that we're having different microbial processes happening. So aerobic restoration will draw down this oxygen, and then we start to see, you know, nitrogen reduction, creating this pool of nitrate that then is utilized, then we have magnesium reduction, iron reduction, because we start to see iron becoming prevalent that can then be utilized. Um, and one of the big ones that's been studied is sort of this sulfate methane um, transition zone. Um, and it's studied for a lot of different reasons, um, but that it's also, we start to see one of the reasons that this is studied in great detail is that there are, let's, somehow I there are orthogenic minerals that start forming. Um, that this is our location that we start to see the formation of pyrite. Um, and we see, in addition to pyrite, we might see mckinnonite, which is just an amorphous iron sulfide or Greigite. And up higher, in some cases, folks have suggested that maybe in some of these zones, we might see magnetite forming. Higher up during this um, sort of oxic zone, this is where we might be getting our pigmentary hematite forming, if we think of our CRMs. Um, this is where we're getting that hematite forming or, you know, our pigmentary hematite started out as ferrihydrite. So all these 
you know, autogenic mineral um, formation is happening, but there's also dissolution happening. Um, to form this um, pyrite and this grigite, a lot of these other sort of iron phases that were either detrital or chemically formed are then dissolving. So that's sort of what I'm going to focus on today is talking about magnetite dissolution in this interval. And then also at the end, sort of thinking about some um, ways that grigite might be forming as well. So that's the outline. Um, and I'm also going to try to tie it to, as the prompt was, try to tie this to the Magnetics Information um, Consortium. So I'm going to sort of, I chose two projects um, that I thought had um, some cool implications and things, um, ways forward for the magic community to be thinking about, and I'll highlight those as well. Okay, so our first one is um, Magnetite Dissolution and Preservation. And this is a very sort of simplified model, um, once again, of our zones. Um, but, you know, you see over here, depth is arbitrary. Um, that's because this can change. But this idea is that we have sort of our primary magnetic mineral assemblage that was detritally deposited. Um, and this is based on sort of um, Andy had like looked and studied a lot of different cores. Then there's this zone of magnetite dissolution that occurs. And then we see some Greek guide formation. And the idea is that um, sort of from the literature, this magnetite dissolution is happening. Um, it's actually an abiotic process, but biology is involved in this sort of circuitous way that the biology is fueling this um, sulfate reduction zone, which is happening right here. So sulfate reduction is a, um, a microbial metabolism, and it's taking organic matter, taking sulfate, and then as a byproduct, it's producing... Um, some bicarbonate, but also some hydrogen sulfide. And that's what's accumulating right here. That hydrogen sulfide will react just abiotically very, very, very quickly with any iron that is around. Um, and there are certain types of iron that might be more highly reactive than other types, um, but magnetite definitely gets hit. Um, and that's where we see a lot of our magnetite dissolving. And that's sort of shown in this um, equation here where we have our aqueous um, hydrogen sulfide reacting with magnetite and that's forming our pyrite as well as changing the overall chemistry as well. Um, and so if we're trying to understand, I sort of have dissolution preservation here because some people might be like, all oh, my magnetite's dissolving. If you're a glass half optimistic, we can also preserve magnetite, right? that if we understood these processes better, maybe we can see the flip side of like, how are we preserving it? How are we seeing through this? So if we're trying to understand factors that would allow magnetite preservation to happen, we wanna be thinking about sulfate. We wanna be thinking about the organic matter that's in our sediments when they get deposited, the total organic matter. But there's one other factor that's really important. And that's some nuance that Andy also um, sort of diagrammed really well here um, based on some studies that his group has do had done, which was that there's this, um, there's sort of a zone of active microbial metabolisms in that core, in those sort of sediments, in that sediment column. And so what sometimes is seen is that there's sort of a dissolution front and then it jumps up. Um, and so the idea is that what you're actually doing is if you can move your sediment very, very quickly through this active microbial window, um, it's a little unclear from the microbiology side why there should be an active microbial window, but if you can move it really quickly through that, you might be able to have a lot more preservation. So this is where sedimentation rate becomes important. And there's some studies, um, some really good studies from the 90s and other times that have really shown this, um, that it seems to work for magnetite um, in some cases. So these were three factors that um, have sort of been pointed to as allowing for magnetite to be preserved in ancient systems. And so we decided to sort of test these factors and ask, you know, hypothesize and say, okay, like which one of them is the most important? Can we move toward a model of magnetite dissolution or preservation that's a bit more global in nature? And we did this through, it's not big data, we're not there yet, through medium data. Um, and what we found was that there, um, every IODP ship that goes out makes really, really good records of poor water chemistry. So we have that sulfate data. TOC is also very frequently measured. 
Sedimentation rate is huge as well for them. There's often an age model associated with all of those cores based on really careful biostratigraphy or based on magnetostratigraphy or based on um, radiometric age calibrations throughout. So we were able to get all three of these from IODP records. Um, but magnetite abundance, while magnetostratigraphy is regularly measured, magnetite um, and rock magnetic parameters are not always measured as frequently from the IODP cores. But what we were able to do is um, we actually were able to find this data. And what we did was a very simple approximation. So I'm happy to talk about this. But the idea was that if we could get magnetite from saturation magnetization, we're making a huge assumption, but we're saying we're going to find our, um, our saturation magnetization. We're going to divide it by 92. And this is going to tell us an approximation of how much magnetite is in our sample. Reason we chose 92 is because this is sort of the pure saturation magnetization um, of what MS is. If you talk to people who measure it, there's a wide range. Oxidation can be important. Um, and of course, we're making an assumption that our saturation magnetization value is coming purely from um, magnetite and that it isn't coming from other phases. We're not as worried about hematite and, and gertite. They're like orders of magnitude less. Um, the bigger ones to worry about are, are iron sulfides. So grigite, which I already mentioned, can form. Um, grigite is an issue, pyrotite is an issue. Um, they're about a third to a sixth. Um, so they're in like the 15 to 30 um, amp meter squared per kilogram for the sort of, um, if you're trying to understand. So they would have an influence, but um, they're not, we would still think that magnetite, if it was present, might be the dominant signal. Um, so we searched in the many databases that were online. We looked at the magic database. There were no studies. There was one study, Brennan had a study, um, but there, there were no studies that had this information on the magic database. So then we turned to other databases and we found Pangea actually had a lot of, it had a really great search interface. We were able to search saturation magnetization. We found it. We also just started searching Google Scholar for environmental magnetists who had been doing work in the past several years. And uh, we emailed out those people in those papers and said, can you send us your raw data? And our community was really great. And many people sent us that raw data. So we were able to get that. Um, so we had a lot of sites, but we were worried about Grigite. So we carefully read the paper. And if any study mentioned concerns about iron sulfide formation, or if that was the focus of their study, which for some people it was, we had to not use that data. So these are, we got 19 sites in the end that we felt that we could get all this data for. Um, and so we went with those. There were a lot more, but collecting all this data took a long time. And so this is sort of what we went forward with as sort of a first start of trying to understand, you know, how much magnetite is there and um, trying to understand any factors. Um, oh, I put up a huge table because we are in the community, and so some people's names might be up there. So that's why there's that huge, if you have a favorite core, maybe it's up there. But this is a global map for those of you who don't have IODP cores memorized. Um, so, so yeah, so here's a global map. So one thing that is also true is we were trying to do a global comp compilation, but you notice um, Antarctica is heavily overrepresented. Um, mostly because of Brendan's work um, and Stephanie's work. But, um, but there are certain places, coastal environments are a little more um, represented. Certain areas of the globe might be more represented than, um, than sort of these more um, sort of center of the ocean. So there, there could be some changes um, that we need to worry about, but we were hoping that we had enough data at all latitudes and, and spread across the globe to sort of um, minimize those biases. So this is our simple magnetite calculation in abundance. And so pretty much um, all our data is plotted in the blue. And um, the data of this is just our conversion of MS to magnetite, magnetite abundance. And then all of our data um, that was below 50 meters below seafloor is in green. And the reason we did that was because we noticed that a lot of our data was coming from really shallow cores that were only like five meters deep. And our question was about long-term preservation. And so we were a little worried that they may not have seen the full window of diagenesis that like, you know, a hundred meter, 200 meter core might see. Um, and so that's sort of why there's this difference. And as you look here, you notice that there is a difference. 
Um, there sort of was a bimodal distribution um, initially, um, but that potentially um, some of these sort of high, you know, sudden influxes of detrital material that maybe were causing this high um, peak, um, they were altered. So when we look at sort of below 50 meters below sea, um, sea floor, we actually see sort of this mean peak that agrees that is um, between about, we said, you know, 100 and 500 ppm. But that's sort of a average that we were seeing come out of, of our global data. So now we're going to plot all of our individual data points and compare them to each of our factors that we had. And you see here, um, well, I guess I don't have the number of samples, but we didn't have sulfate data for every single sample. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll list at the top how many, how many data points we're actually using. Um, it's somewhere in like the 3000 range for this diagram. So this is our sulfate. Um, and so the data does not necessarily look pretty. Um, the other thing to notice is that um, on the bottom, we are on a log scale. So our prediction would be that um, sulfate, at high levels of sulfates, we would see sort of, you know, high levels of magnetite. And then as sulfate decreases, we assume that it's being consumed and that that's actually part of that um, dissolution process happening. And so we would see magnetite levels drop. And we actually do see this because since this is on a log, semi-log plot, a straight line that would go this way actually turns into sort of a curved line. So we do see that. That's what we're interpreting is happening sort of here. There's some scatter, but we think that we see a pretty good um, correlation. Um, the one interesting thing that we see is that, you know, there, it, there are some tail scatters over here at the high range. Many of these um, really high magnetite values were events, really instantaneous ash beds or something. And so we think that that sort of maybe is what's causing some of this sort of scatter over here is that sulfate levels are really low because there was an instantaneous depositional event that maybe didn't capture that really well. Um, okay. Um, the one thing that we'll see as we keep going, but one thing that's really interesting and nuanced about this data, um, so we interpreted from this that sulfate was an important factor, um, but that there was a lot of site-specific variance. And so here are two drill cores, um, data from two drill cores sort of plotted by us. And what we see is here, notice the depth scale. Here we see our sulfate going down and we see delightfully our magnetite also goes down, maybe at a slightly different scale, but very close. And this all happens within the top meter of the sediment water um, interface, that top meter. This, um, sam this drill core on the other hand, the sulfate also goes down. This takes a hundred meters. So this is our depth scale here. So this is taking, this is a much slower decrease in the sulfur, um, in the sulfate than in other zones. And at the same time, we also see that our magnetite abundance goes up. And so there were several, there were a few cases like this that stood out as being really unique. And so that really, you know, as we were, we sort of entered thinking maybe we could get a global, global model and we just kept hitting these edge cases that in our 19 set of studies that we looked at, it did seem, 19 sites, 20 data sets, it did seem that there were a lot of site specific influences that could be difficult to untangle. Okay, so. Um, so then we also looked at sedimentation rate. Um, and it's been suggested that it's really important, but here we found, you know, we did maybe see that, okay, if we have high sedimentation rates, maybe we'd expect higher amounts of magnetite following this same sort of swoop, but it's a little more complicated. And then when we zoom in um, to sort of these low levels, maybe you see a bit more of that um, positive connection, but it was a little hard to tell. Part of this is because the reason we have our sedimentation rate um, drawn this way is because it uh, we sometimes would have one sediment rate for a lot of data points. And so we chose to average those. Um, but yeah, so sedimentation rate might be a bit important. Um, then if we move to total organic carbon, we really didn't notice um, that there was a strong correlation, which is really interesting because that's the one that drives the sulfate reduction. And that's the one that people really point to. And we felt that this had the weakest link. Um, one thing here that um, we were really excited about is that we also, um, I have some interest in earth history. And as I mentioned, this can be, you, you know, we think about magnetite as we think about sort of maybe um, environments and using it as an as a ancient redox proxy. 
Um, and so we tried to find if there was any way within our global compilation to identify, identify orthogenesis, so magnetite formation within the pore water space or within the water column. So these black diamonds are from the Baltic Sea. And this area right down here is an area where there was magnetite orthogenesis appearing. Um, sort of based on another study, then we made those additional measurements to show it was happening, but they don't stand out from the rest of the clump. So in your normal sediment water column, sort of in your normal um, sediment stack, that magnetite orthogenesis might be difficult to identify um, if you just were trying to do it purely based on numbers as opposed to comparing it to above and below. Whereas these samples are actually from Lake Tawudi, these diamonds. Lake Tawudi is a ferruginous lake in Indonesia, and it stands out. We did... Um, a KS test, I'm gonna forget the long name, but we did a statistical test that showed that this population was really distinct from the rest, just from a pure magnetite abundance perspective. And so this really shows us that if we had a ferruginous water column above our system, above our sediments, we think that that signal should be distinct from sort of an oxygenated um, sort of, it's also a low sulfate environment, I should also mention, um, but distinct from a, moderate sulfate um, sort of um, oxygenated environment that we just see much higher amounts of magnetite. Um, so conclusions for this part, I realized the timing, I'm like, yeah, but yeah, is that sulfate seemed to have the most direct influence on magnetite dissolution. Um, and then we also, sedimentation rate was a little more complex. Um, total organic carbon seemed to have the least influence. Site-specific complexity really prevented us from feeling comfortable jumping to this global quantitative model for diagenesis. But um, from a sort of paleo redox perspective, we did from this global compilation get sort of a baseline, this framework of like a magnetite range in the modern ocean is maybe between 100 and 500 ppm and that ferruginous water bodies could have a distinct, um, distinct value. And then this search and sort of this process really showed to me um, that expanding the magic database to rock magnetic data could really have research implications, right? We think of the importance of magic for, you know, some of these paleo intensity or paleomagnetic, um, paleogeographic um, sort of compilations, but maybe we could learn a lot through my rock magnetic data as well. So now I'm going to show you some, that was sort of submitted um, yesterday. Um, but yes, that's a submitted paper. So I wanted to show some ongoing work really, really quickly about Kriegite formation. And that's sort of the idea is that, you know, we were dissolving our magnetite, but that we also could be forming Kriegite. And this has been shown a lot of folks who are dealing with some sedimentary records are always struggling. They're like, oh my gosh, Kriegite's showing up. It's messing up my magnetostratigraphy. The actual process by which it happens is really poorly understood. There's a ton of hypotheses and there's also arguments about the stability of Greekite, whether it's stable over long periods of Earth history or whether it will transform to pyrite almost immediately. Um, and we decided to study this process. This is often done in sediments. Um, and the one problem with sediments is some of these transformations can happen in like sub centimeter scale. So we might need to, you know, be using some of our microscopic tools or subsampling in interesting ways. Whereas if we look at a chemocline or a merimectic lake system, we're expanding that transition across meters of water depth. So we actually are looking for this Griegite formation happening not in the sediments, but actually in the water column by looking at lakes that are chemically stratified. They're called merimectic lakes. There's a lot of fun jargon on here, PMAG likes jargon, so do limnologists. And, um, but pretty much the idea is that you have like a lower um, mass of water that is always separated from sort of this overturning circulation that happens on the top. And so it's separated, it has a different chemistry. And in the state of New Hampshire, there were three previously reported um, meromictic lakes and we visited them, they're sort of here, but then um, we, I guess we visited two of them. And then we also, um, tried to use some geomorphology to think about um, how we might identify others. And so we actually potentially have found two to three others um, that are listed here of meromictic lates. And those are all shown here. We've tested them, um, but to actually show that something's meromictic, uh, you have to go out in the summer and the winter. Um, and we've only done that in one of these. Um, 
whole pond, which I'm going to show data from. Okay, so, so we went to these lakes um, in a little raft or in the winter, hiked out in the middle of the frozen pond. And then we measured the water depth. So this is now water depth. It is not sediment depth. And we measured the chemistry. Um, and specifically, you can see here that in all of these mammomictic lakes that we were measuring, we see that we're having, you know, and this is this redox potential. We can think of like, it's a little weird, but like maybe there's more like ions around, like more sulfide hanging out. Versus here with our oxygen, we're seeing an increase in oxygen. We're seeing a decrease in oxygen. So we're getting anoxic waters. And then what we did is we filtered the water that we collected at different depths in the lake. And then we put it on a VSM. We filtered it in three separate filters mm -hmm. and we put it on the VSM and we were actually able to get magnetic signal and hysteresis loops. Um, and that's what's shown here. Um, we seem to see maybe a decrease at the top you know, of initial signal. And then, you know, in some of our sort of filter sizes, it keeps decreasing, other ones that hold steady. Um, so this was maybe not the most illuminating data to get right away. I was just excited that we were able to measure filtered water. Um, and then here though, we were able to, um, this sample is from the 0.1 micron filter located at 10 meters depth. So it's sort of this black one. So in some of our stronger samples, we were able to get good DCD curves um, and try to do some unmixing. Um, and it suggested maybe there were two components to our magnetization, um, but also this component here, um, sort of it's about 40 millitesla, which is on the high end of magnetite, but is very possible, but it's potentially, it could be Griegeit. So we were starting to get excited that maybe we had Griegeit. Um, and within the context, we should say, um, you know, we knew that we were in sort of this anoxic environment, that there was a lot of sulfide around. So we, we knew that there was that potential. We then had a dredge that we could scoop up some magnetism, some, some sediment at the bottom. And so this sample is from sort of, we had like a dredge that big. And so from the bottom of it, um, of our Ekman, um, we were able to collect sediment sample and we boosted our signal. So this shows very similar magnetization as what we were seeing in that bottom sample. Um, and in these samples, you know, with an order of magnitude stronger magnetization, we were able to run some fork diagrams and we saw really good sharp central ridge. It goes up to really high coercivities here um, and suggesting there was some single domain. We do have some spread. Maybe there's some vortex, you know, MD stuff as well, but really pretty fork diagrams. Um, but this still didn't tell us that we agree that we were getting more excited, but we weren't certain. So we called up Roger and said, can we come down and use your 2G to do gyro remnant magnetization? And this is a tool um, that pretty much the idea is that if you apply an AF field um, to your sample, your sample will acquire an AF field in the opposite direction. So it's sort of like this cross product, but you apply it in one way and it will go in another way. And so we actually were able to apply these fields since our samples, um, since we'd already run ARM on them and done all this stuff, we actually applied an ARM first and then did the AF um, because we were a bit worried um, with just the NRM. It was too, you know, anyway, we messed it up too much. Um, and we do see GRM. That's what's being shown here. We see sort of with each axis, we're sort of bouncing around, creating these pretty triangles with anyone who's ever demagged using AF and run into GRM. This is what you see. That you see sort of these triangles as you're measuring your different axes repeating over and over. Um, I'm going to breeze through this because Nick's standing up and I guess I have to, time is a, time is a thing. But we measured more lakes and there's a lot more nuance. Um, here's two lakes measured at different seasons. We see different profiles. One is a sharp oxygen transition. One is a much broader. And we see different signals in our filtered water and in our saturation magnetization data. So we think that there's probable Griegeit formation in the water column with these meromictic lakes and that GRM was really important in identifying it, but that detailed lake chemistry could be really important. That's what we're untangling. We now have you know, data from four lakes, some sampled at multiple times and just trying to understand you know, this underlying process is gonna be difficult um, to try to more, under, more broadly understand Griegeit formation. But um, thinking about, you know, we weren't able to use PMAG quite easily to plot our data. So thinking about how maybe um, that tool could be utilized for GRM. And with that, I'll take questions. Okay.
Um, you know, Lake Ely that I worked on in Pennsylvania is a very big lake, and it's dominated by magnetosomes. Mm -hmm. Did you look for magnetosomes? So we've started to do, so that sharp ridge could be, I mean, that could be magnetosomes where we don't know. We're sort of hoping they're Griegite magnetosomes. We got really excited about that. We're doing TEM work on, um, on these, and TEM is a brand, wonderful new field. And so I have pretty pictures, but right now we don't know how to interpret them. So um, we're sort of in the process shown here, trying to understand despacing or, you know, in this example, you can zoom in and measure despacing between here. So we haven't seen any clear magnetosomes based on our um, TEM sort of initial look. Um, nothing has stood out, but we're hoping that that could be another tool that we could use. Yeah.